Thank you. It's great to have you here. Well, good after afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for coming to this very special event. I start by um, acknowledging and celebrating the first Australians on whose traditional land we meet and pay our respects to the elders of the Ngunnawal people, past, present and emerging. Welcome. I am Roxanne Missingham and I'm the University Librarian at this wonderful university and it's a great privilege for me to be able to have the opportunity to reveal to you a great collection that we have acquired and also to be able to have an event where we engage with absolutely eminent researchers to talk about the significance of issues in Papua New Guinea and to be able to think about how we can continue to work in a collegial partnership model with our researchers. It's very important. I'd like in particular to welcome the Acting High Commissioner to Australia from Papua New Guinea, Mr. Sakas Tameo. It's just wonderful to have you here. He'll be doing the official work today. Thank you. So in welcoming you to the exhibition and to the library, I thought I'd start, um, I, I've got to confess that I spent many years as the head of the Parliamentary Library and Parliamentary Research Office. So parliamentary speeches are one of my specialities, but I'm always moved by the second reading speech that created the Australian National University in 1946. So then Minister for Post-War Reconstruction, um, Mr. Deadman said, in creating the ANU, how important it was that the institution be in Canberra, that it be a national institution of national significance, and also commented, we have also greatly increased responsibility sh to shoulder in relation to other people, particularly to those with whom we are associated as a Pacific power. The whole field of Pacific studies awaits fuller development than it has previously received in Australia. This was 1946, so 40 years before Durax images and, <coughs> and really starting off ANU on a strong Pacific foot. Our relations with the East, with the Americas, with the East Indies, New Zealand, New Guinea, and all the Pacific Islands must be carefully studied in order that they may become friendly and fruitful, as they must be if our future is to be safeguarded and if we are able to, if we are to make our full contribution to the Council of Nations. So he saw it as not just an ANU responsibility, but ANU shouldering a, shouldering a national responsibility. And it is fantastic that the Pacific Institute continues to take that responsibility for ANU to the world. And I should start by acknowledging and thanking the Pacific Institute for their sponsorship of this event and the exhibition. ANU has a very long history of research in and with Papua New Guinea, and this collection both builds and celebrates upon this work, providing new access to resources for f further studies. Elizabeth Clancy, Clancy Elizabeth Durack Clancy, <coughs> persuaded the Minister for External Territories, Mr Barnes, to fund her visit to Papua New Guinea. When she spoke to the Minister, he said she should do something on the women in Papua New Guinea, um, which is a very interesting statement for our um, minister to make and we have on the website scholarly essays about Elizabeth Durack's work and the various sets of images and it is fascinating to look at the um, what was then the Department of External Territories but now Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade documents of the period where they saw strengthening society in Papua New Guinea as an important issue and they saw gender in very early simple language as one of the issues that was important without having a well-developed policy. And of course, many would argue we're still not seeing well-developed policies that understand gender in relation to Australia's foreign affairs, but it's good to see that it was recognised in a nascent way. So at this period, Australia had a fascination with Papua New Guinea. We had over 2,000 patrol visits, patrol officers who had stayed in the country in the years preceding this. And we had many scientists, researchers, missionaries, educators who visited Papua New Guinea. And I'm sure the High Commissioner will say there is room for more Australians to visit and support Papua New Guinea. Um, but this was an early period which was a great fascination. But there was also a sense of terror. 
Um, Jane Rifshawi, the very first female doctor to be appointed to Papua New Guinea from Australia, went in 1947 and she was told that Papua New Guinea was man's territory. So it's interesting to read the early um, diaries, reports of Papua New Guinea and to see gender as an issue on a wide range of aspects. So I'd like to, before I introduce our speakers, acknowledge that the collection was acquired from Perpetua and Michael Clancy at Durak and um, they have really continued to take her memory and her fascination with Indigenous people um, to a new level with the work that they've done. So the Durak collection will show you fascinating stories of women, their daily life, their work as community leaders, as nurses, educators, um, as family leaders, as gardeners, as people active in the market, contributing and identifying themselves in the landscape in which they worked and lived. We'll hear two speakers before our official launch. Our first speaker is Chris Bella. <laughs> just checking there. Um, Chris is a very eminent scholar at the Australian National University and as he points out, he's been here since he was a boy but he has now moved to Tahiti to, to extend his experiences. His current interests revolve around indigenous <coughs> Malaysian, Melanesian histor historic cities, their transformation through cross-cultural cross encounters, representation through media, film and fiction, and he has been involved in many, and a leader in many ARC projects, including the ARC Discovery Project on European Naturalists and the Constitution of Human Difference in Oceania. His biography is fascinating. You will read about his roles um, with French organisations and his contribution to the nomination for world heritage status of Chief Roy Mutter's domain on behalf of the people of Vanuatu which is fantastic. Thank you so much. So um, just a few words. I, I love drawings. Um, I'm fascinated by the representation of New Guinea. It's a, a childhood obsession, having grown up there in part. Um, and I think drawings, for me, illuminate the relationship between uh, the artists and subjects in a way that almost no other art form does. Um, it's no accident that amongst the first representations we have of New Guineans are the drawings by these early explorers, people like Prado in 1606, travelling with Torres from the south coast, who produced four panels, each one with um, several figures in it carrying um, spears, children, billums, um, and you can just see the faintest traces of local identity in these drawings. You can see something that might be an Asmat shield, for instance. But there's no identity, there's no individuality um, in the characters. And there isn't for many centuries to come. Scouten, the Dutch explorer in 1616 from the Islanders, uh, um, Gilson uh, as well in 1643, and then the British coming up from Australia, people like Oswald Brawley and Owen Stanley in the 1840s, mapping that south coast of Papua New Guinea, where Port Moresby is today and producing exquisite drawings with remarkable ethnographic detail. Virtually no names. So these are always a native of, it's the a native of period of representation of Papua New Guinea. That changes dramatically in the 1870s with the Russian humanist and anthropologist Nikolai McClue McClay, who spends off and on about 13 years living in different parts of Melanesia, um, most famously on the Rye Coast but also all along the coast, the south coast of Papua. Um, and he produces these highly individual portraits. He finds he doesn't have a language in common. He's living for months, sometimes years at a time in communities. He finds it extraordinarily difficult without topism to even find a way to learn local language. So he draws and he asks names and he adds the names to the drawings and then he asks word lists and he adds those to the edge of the drawing. And what you get is an entire ethnography built around a drawing, built around a portrait of a person. And you can almost reconstruct the sort of the tone of the, uh, of the moment, the sweat, there's um, all sorts of evidence of the production of each drawing, but there's also just this kind of choreography of, of annotations of marginalia developing around the central drawing. Um, 
And when you look at his writing about the drawing, you see some beautiful moments. He's drawing a young girl in hula um, and drawing a tattoo in her armpit. Um, and after he's done his sketch, she comes over and she looks at it. She says, you haven't got that right. So she lifts her arm again and he has to change it. <laughs> so it's a lovely, it's no accident that um, we talk about taking photographs but making drawings. Drawings are co-produced um, between the artist and the subject. Um, so to turn to Elizabeth Durack, she's by no means the first woman artist um, of any nationality uh, in Papua New Guinea. And I point to just one, Nora Hayson, who was Australia's first official war artist. She was dispatched to draw nurses and patients in the army hospital at Finchhaf in 1944. There was quite a lot of debate. There's a whole file and a whole dossier um, about whether she should be commissioned as a captain and paid at male rates, which she was. Um, although it was firmly written that there should not be a precedent for pay rates. <laughs> um, but she was almost court-martialed when she digressed and was caught painting roses. Um, she wasn't there to paint Papua New Guineans, however. She was there to paint nurses and patients in the army hospital. So, um, as Roxanne has mentioned, um, Elizabeth Dirac was commissioned in 1968 um, by the Department of External Territories, newly formed under the Gordon um, administration, the Gordon government, um, with the old Northern Territory hive, um, hived off, and really a department that now focused on exactly what its title suggests, the external territories, Cocos and Keeling, um, the Territory of New Guinea, Territory of Papua, and Christmas Island. Um, and just to give the full quote that Roxanne um, used, it's, it comes from her NLA uh, interview. She says the first of the Seeing Through series of books, um, she did a, a few more later, was one that occurred through a link with the Australian government, Mr. Barnes. Mr. Charles Barnes was Minister for Territories at the time. We met in some way in Canberra, as you do. And I said, I'd love to go to Papua New Guinea. And then it was worked out through his department that they didn't think that the women, uh, though the men were coming forward towards the oncoming independence, the women were not getting the same amount of attention. He said, do something on the women of Papua New Guinea. And so that's how that came about. I went up to Papua New Guinea and moved right through, drawing the women, and that took the shape of a book called Face Value. And then on to that, I wrote The Experiences of Travelling Through This Country, which was a marvellous adventure. So a sojourner, somebody visiting Papua New Guinea, not deeply invested in it, but some are perhaps well placed to do some of that interpretive work. This was about presenting Papua New Guinea to Australians, because ultimately Australians were going to make the decision about Papua New Guinea's independence. And Hank Nelson, um, the historian, has made that point very clearly, that when independence came to Papua New Guinea, although it was to some extent mutually agreed upon, the timing was absolutely determined by Australia and pushed by Australia. She travelled by road, boat and air. Um, she was met by mothers, grandmothers, nurses, wives and teachers, nuns and students, villagers and welfare workers, politicians, gardeners, socialites and market stall holders. She started in Borsby, travelled through the highlands, Goroka, Kundiawa, Hagen, Bololo Lay, Madang, across to Gwiwak and the Sepik, Angorum and Bunti, and then out to Manus, New Ireland. And she produced these two books Face Value, the Women of Papua New Guinea, and Seeing Through Papua New Guinea, an Artist's Impressions of the Territory, both published in 1970. It's hard not to be attracted to the portraits that are individual, the ones that have the names. Um, and what you see very clearly is that the village women are treated generically. The women of the market, the women of the islands, old men, drummers. Um, and it's really this focus on the urban elite, on the rising women, the educated women, themselves teachers or nurses, um, that her work focuses and, and that's where you see the individuality and, and the real portraiture come through. And these people are all named as they should have been. Rosalind Kamava, Florence Inabi, Mezi Talibas, Lina Bebe, Esther Diaya, Kathy Lay, the daughter of Dan Lay and Mansi. And I think Margaret will talk about some of the others. One lesser known aspect of Elizabeth Durek's work is a return trip in 1969 for CRA. Um, and that was, again, the result of a chance meeting with Sir Morris Morby, uh, who was on the board of CRA at an exhibition in Melbourne. And he invited her to come up and draw paint the Pangunamai. 
Um, and she went up and she started drawing jungle scenes. And then the more time she spent up there, the more she started to draw slightly darker scenes. Um, and using these enormous uh, mason-like boards and tearing up her jungle paintings and plastering them onto these mason-like boards. Um, her brother was an engineer and said, um, uh, really told her something about what was happening. Um, and I think there's a, he said, oh, Elizabeth, if, if anything was an argument for the environmentalists, it's Bougainville Island. Mm -hmm. You've no idea to go over the mouth of the river and see in the mud the crocodiles floating with their bellies exposed, dead. The desecration, he said, was incredible. And this, there's a, a shift in her work. Now, CRA bought some of it. Um, I think, well, I think they acquired all of it, they commissioned it all. And a certain amount of it was acquired by the board, shown to them, and, and then placed in the CRA collection, which is now, I think, in Perth. Part of it's in the Melbourne University Library. Um, but a huge proportion of it just simply, simply disappeared and she never saw it again. So I think that's what I want to say at the moment. These are works of their time and they have to be understood as such. I like the fact that we've got 1968 in the title. It makes it very clear what we're looking at. Um, it's important to appreciate them both stylistically as works of the 1960s and politically as works by an Australian groping towards this idea that Papua New Guineans would one day be equal. So our next speaker is Professor Margaret Jolly. Um, Margaret is, will be known to many of you not just for her research and writing, but her commitment to and depth of uh, research into gender issues. She's an ARC Laureate Fellow and Professor of, in the School of Culture, History and Language at the College of Asia and the Pacific and a Fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences in Australia. She's an, histo an historical anthropologist who has written extensively on gender in the Pacific, and some of her works on Papua New Guinea are displayed. Um, and she has travelled, sought to understand the whole of Pacific culture. She has been a very broad thinker and is currently convener of the ANU Gender Institute in her spare time as well. <laughs> She's wonderful and I'm sure you will enjoy her words as well. Thank you so much. I usually don't give caveats and apologies, but um, I have to say I'm at the end of an incredibly overwhelming week with some wonderful overseas guests from the Marshall Islands, public lectures, etc. And uh, Chris, thank you for that wonderful, uh, you know, really sort of broad uh, distillation of, of your thoughts. Um, and I'm afraid I'm going to be echoing you in, in, in some aspects, but I just wanted to point first of all, I mean, I find this collection completely intriguing. And really, I've just roamed around outside. I haven't had time to do the online research yet. But I can't help but sort of situate Durack in the context of someone who grew up in that sort of Kimberley context of intercultural encounter in Australia, a sort of Irish descendant, sort of pastoral family. And of course, you know, CMG, OBE, established a huge kind of fame as an artist, as a writer. Um, and I also can't fail to mention that she also established a lot of notoriety when she assumed what she calls the nom de plume of Eddie Birup, Indigenous male Australian artist. Uh, and I think that that's a really interesting uh, question about the reversal of, uh, of, of both her gender identity and, and, and her racial identity. And that, you know, secure, of course, that, can, that absolutely generated a huge controversy amongst Indigenous artists in Australia. And so I can't help but look at these drawings, but in the context of that Australian um, context, and, and in, indeed the kind of fate of that uh, controversy. Uh, she is really renowned uh, as an artist, as an illustrator of books, of Aboriginal stories, etc., etc. Um, but here I think, you know, it's very important to see a particular racialized interaction as white woman traveller, sojourner in your terms, Chris, in relationship to, to um, the, the topography of, uh, of PNG. Um, I actually really like how the drawings are situated in the library at the moment. 
I love the fact that they're almost enclosed or at least skirted about by the creative productions of Papua New Guinea women, of Billums, of beautiful Pandanus textiles and so forth. So I think it will, I, I don't know quite how that appears online, but I really, I really sort of appreciate that. Um, because Chris has already detailed some of the context and the purpose of, of this, I won't be repeating that. I, I am, you know, also like him, attracted to the idea that this was one of those Canberra moments, a sort of chance, chance encounter. Do something on the women of, of Papua New Guinea. But in some ways, I kind of read that really as a kind of confession that the colonial government had done very little on, 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 on the women of Papua New Guinea. And I think that there was, uh, in this period, most definitely a sense that this was a man's territory, not just in the sense of the character of Australian colonialism, but also in terms of how, how um, uh, Australians were dealing with, with Papua New Guineans in, in general. Um, I was quite intrigued by seeing the kind of research that, that she did to go into this journey. I was intrigued by her rather poor, sketchy reproductions of early maps of, of PNG. I was also intrigued that on her reading list, and who knows how much of this she actually read and how much she, she simply looked at them, um, works by Margaret Mead, um, uh, Peter Lawrence, alongside David Attenborough, Suja, and, and, and all the rest. So um, I think that um, in terms of the content of, 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 this, um, of, of these drawings, like Chris, I, I would say that the portraits are, in, are really very empathetic. And I think that that, in some ways, I want to contrast with a sort of longer history, a longer history of less empathetic portraiture. I mean, not just going back to the 17th century and, and, and ethnic typifications, but I'm reminded, I mean, this is not somebody who was a visual artist, but I can't help but contrast her journey with that of someone like Beatrice Grimshaw in the early part of the 20th century, who I think gives the most kind of negative and vilifying depictions of, of, people, uh, of women in, in the western part of, of the Pacific. And I think that her, um, the visual kind of emphasis in these portraits is also important to situate in the context of a very salvationist emphasis that you get coming from missionaries uh, about, I mean, who really <coughs> present a very negative picture of the indigenous situation of Papua New Guinean women. Working too hard in the gardens, carrying too much wood and water, um, and also, and, and of course, this is quite a generalized picture of sort of inordinate sort of male domination. So I think that, that we have to read it in the context of, of those kinds of earlier and co-present sort of representations. I also noticed instantly <laughs> this contrast between the way in which we see Alice Wodega, for example, the way in which we see Veta Hawafa, the way in which we see Amy, a a a Amy uh, Asoli uh, of New, New Ireland, uh, all of these women who are, if you might say, in the kind of um, the educated el elite, uh, are really differently represented to the women in, in village and rural contexts, where there is much more, I mean, for example, titles like Girl of Sepik, and you know, this much more sort of generic representation. I think that that is very intriguing in terms of <coughs> the history of debates in, uh, about the visual uh, representations by foreigners of, of the Pacific and this sort of tension between individuating persons and representing collectivities. In the early voyage material of Cook and so forth, you often get individuals represented in Polynesia and generic racialized kind of uh, depictions in, 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 in the western part of the, sea, the Pacific, later named Melanesia. So I think that that's really sort of quite intriguing. And I wanted to kind of, um, I suppose now, situate that in terms of the way in which a number of these women who are put into categories like nuns, nurses and midwives, teachers, how a lot of the, um, the context in their work, in, in the, uh, of their work have everything to do with the kind of range of effort of Christian missions in, in, in Papua New Guinea. And I want to critically reflect back on some of the, the early writings that I've done that you've got in your class cases there, uh, particularly Family and Gender in the Pacific, where Martha McIntyre, uh, uh, Pat Grimshaw and a number of us 
reflecting on the very dramatic transformations of domesticity and of gender relations uh, in, in, in the western part of, well, in fact, across, across the Pacific. And I think that that, I would still not resolve from that analysis. I think that the project of, of focusing women's attention on their, their roles as, as wives and mothers was very strong in, in the Christian mission, mission emphasis on, on the salvation of, of, of BNG women. But equally, and this is something that Havel Chu and I have articulated in a recent book called Divine Domesticities about Asia and the Pacific, I think that that was also complemented by a, a, a church-based education that also brought women into new public roles mm -hmm. as nurses, as teachers, etc. So I think it's really interesting to think about these women in relationship to that. By contrast, I would absolutely agree with the analysis of Anne Dixon Wyko, a wonderful PNG scholar, that the colonial state really sort of extruded women from the space of modernity that the colonial state in a sort of labor laws that were really um, uh, you know, insisting that it was men engaged in, in male migrant uh, labor schemes, by really um, engaging much more with men in the space of, uh, of the commodity economy, and most definitely seeing that in the realm of politics this was a, a, a men's territory, that I think that the, the colonial state can actually be seen to be creating that man's territory that, that many, many uh, writers have, have reflected upon. And so in some ways I see Barnes do something about the women as in some ways a kind of, you know, the subtext of, of that is that the colonial state had done very little in terms of a, a women's situation um, uh, in, in, in that time. I just finally want to have a couple of words on the future uses of, of, of this collection and congratulations on, on uh, the library making it so available, acquiring this collection and making it available. I'm hoping that it's not just of use to scholars here in Australia and also scholars in the broader Oceanic region, but I'm hoping, as has happened to a lot of collections like this that go online, that it will also be of, of great interest to the descendants of some of the people represented here and in fact, all of the contemporary citizens of, of uh, the very diverse and large country of, of, of PNG. And I'm in fact looking forward to some future exhibitions that we're going to have at, at uh, ANU, which are going to be showing us not just the efflorescence of indigenous artists at the time of independence, but how those visual arts have really been uh, dramatically sort of flourishing since that time in 1975. So thank you very much, Roxanne. Thank you. That's just wonderful. I should actually put a promotion in. Our next exhibition will be on Pacific navigation. Ooh. This is a very strong Pacific year and the link to research and enabling greater access to knowledge um, through collections and scholarship is uh, really important to us. So thank you for your words as well. Uh, now, uh, for the official launch, and we don't have a red button to press, website is live, you can move the mouse. And of the physical exhibition, we are very privileged to have the Acting High Commissioner for Papua New Guinea, Mr. Sakaz Tamayo. Please come in. Say something. Good afternoon. Thank you, uh, Roxanne, for the very uh, nice uh, introduction. Uh, good afternoon, uh, distinguished guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I'm honoured to be invited to be part of this uh, event to launch the exhibition of the artwork and paintings of Dr. Elizabeth Durek. Durek and uh, I'm happy to uh, see the good attendance this afternoon. Um, I'm seeing some Papua New Guineans and uh, others as well, uh, students from the university. So thank you all for coming and it shows that uh, I want to talk about issues concerning Papua New Guinea. I know we have a lot of friends in Canberra, so your presence also demonstrates that you are my friends. Last week uh, we talked about uh, custom, uh, land in Melanesia. And today we are talking about arts. Uh, these are languages that are foreign to a diplomat. Uh, these are things that uh, we don't necessarily talk about, and I, th I don't think my department in front of Asian Mosby 
think that I should be talking about these things. But uh, I think it, it's quite enriching for myself uh, because sometimes you don't know your history. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you take things for granted uh, in terms of your land and your customs. So when ANU runs uh, very important sessions like this, it also gives us this opportunity to, uh, for us to understand more of ourselves. So uh, thank you indeed for this uh, opportunity uh, to, uh, to be here for this launching. Uh, but uh, it's always difficult when you have uh, experts talking to you on the same subject. But uh, let me thank uh, Chris and uh, Margaret for uh, uh, being part of the panel and appreciate your presentations this, uh, this afternoon on this topic. Uh, the artwork, um, drawings and paintings of Papua New Guinea by uh, Dr. Durek was when she traveled to, the pa to Papua New Guinea in 1968. She traveled to many parts of the country. I think she's one of the greatest Australians, I think. She starts in uh, Port Mosby, Hanumbara, and she travels to Leh, and not, she also travels around Rigo and Kerama area as well. And then she goes to Leh, and from Leh she goes up to Kainantu, Kainantu to Goroka, Goroka to Kundiawa, Kundiawa to Mount Hagen, and then she eventually goes to my one of my uh, my province in Anga province. She goes to Wapanamanda, and from uh, there she flew to the Mandangs and Sea Peaks and and Robau. The visits that uh, she made to these places are captured in her two books, Face Valley Woman in Papua New Guinea and Seeing, and the other book Seeing Through Papua New Guinea. Overall, uh, her trip and visit to the country was as alluded to earlier, uh, was to observe, record, and draw some of the indigenous women who taking advantage of the Australian government's encouragement and education opportunities were participating in the modern, in the country's efforts to become abreast of the 21st century. And she was actually looking for the new woman, not the old woman, new woman and the ladies who were stepping up to the scene. Uh, to uh, face the challenges that was ahead. And so, um, apart, and she made a lot of, a lot of uh, interviews, she did a lot of interviews, and she writes, apart from the commentaries uh, of what she did and what she saw, she drew, drew 400 sketches and portraits of girls and women, especially the new woman. And she says, as an artist, the sketches and portraits of the new woman told her a lot of stories. The diversity of our culture, their past ancestral history, their exposure and experience with administration, missions, and so forth. Dr. Derek says in the book, Face Value, Woman in Papua New Guinea, I quote, the faces of the girls and women I drew have the incarnate history of their country and its past. And that is what we have said. Uh, I'm grateful for the displays um, at, the, at, the, at the university, uh, the exhibitions and paintings here. And um, let me also point out, or say here that uh, uh, when, uh, when, Dr., uh, when Elizabeth was interviewing, Marta uh, see, in 1968, so basically 1968 was in the highlands where I come from, in the late 1950s, that was when they, when the administration started going in, you know, and setting up stations and so on and the, and so, late 50s to 60s is just a 10-year period when she's going in, and so, uh, uh, and you know, in the minds of Papua New Guinea, they're wondering what are these white people, you know, are they spirits that uh, of the dead that are returning or what? So. Actually, she is going to an area at a time when there was a lot of confusion, uh, and uh, you know, and, and people were you know, had difficulties, you know, and they were gaining their distances, and, and I think they and, and so it was a and, and language was a big barrier, and so how can and Elizabeth goes and interviews people, and I think most of the interviews are, are the. Uh, Mm -hmm. administration officials and, and the missionaries and 
missionaries are also Confucian missionaries and, and, the, and the administration officials uh, in terms of understanding these uh, people from uh, Papua New Guinea. And equally, the, and the, 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 the Papua New Guineans are confused whether these, these are dead people coming back or what. And so I think it is a period about guessing. Uh, and uh, Elizabeth is recording some of uh, the interviews she is making to the administrations and the missionaries. Um, and uh, that's what missionaries are telling her, that's what they think. Because at the time, you need to communicate, in order to communicate, we need to speak that language. So my people, I think, uh, knew very little uh, English words. And so, once it goes in, even they're not talking with administrations or the missionaries or so on, and so there's a lot of, you know, uh, guessing and all that going on. And actually she's reflecting on the perception and the experience of the administration in terms of what she's recording in the two books. And so the local people are not telling her their experiences. Why? Simply because of the breakdown in communication. And so it was a period of communication when she records this. And so uh, when you read it, that is just a guesswork of missionaries and administration people guessing what other Papua New Guinea is thinking. It's a bunch of lazy people that dance around and sit all day, you know. And the, the Highlanders had no idea about, you know, they had a coffee plantations there, you know. What's the coffee? I mean, the idea about working for something is it's, it's never there. For them, the garden is there, firewood is there, that is fine for the day. They can sing all day long. But to the uh, plantation owners and the administrators and the past and the, and the, and the um, missionaries, they think these are you know a bunch of lazy people. They they don't they don't know how to work. I think there was a, it was a period of uh, mismatch misunderstanding that she went into the country. So I just want to underline this as you're reading uh, her books. I think it is just one way looking into PNG and not Papua New Guinea's uh, giving their views and perspectives on on things. So. Maybe after this uh, session, or whenever I go to Papua New Guinea, I'll talk to uh, with my elders and uh, talk to them. Hey, how, how, what's your perception of these uh, people when they came around at the early period of time? But I just want to uh, caution that uh, um, about uh, having said that. Uh, I think it was a, it was a it was a difficult period uh, uh, when it came, and so. Uh, you know, I think the paintings she did, and this, I recommend those two books uh, to Papua New Guinea, if we can read it. Uh, but I think, I think there are many, you know, good learned people writing books about Papua New Guinea. But I think what she has done, I think, is uh, no place. You know, there is no replacement for the wax she did in terms of actually drawing Papua New Guineans, how they're feeling, their emotions, their experiences. Are they confused? Are they confident? What is ahead of them? You know. And so uh, she did a fantastic job in terms of the uh, in terms of the um, the drawings. The dra her drawings conveys the, the the facial communications of the feelings, emotions, and experiences of our people. I therefore like to pay tribute to Doctor uh, to, to uh, Doctor Elizabeth Drick for the good work she has done in terms of. Um, as he's a great Australian, that will go a long way in terms of preserving the visual history of the past experiences of our people that went through the formative years of our nationhood. Through the drawings and paintings of Dr. Dorek, it will continue to retell and preserve the experiences of the past history of Papua New Guinea now and into the future. May I take this opportunity to thank the uh, Manchester Library at, at ANU for providing a home for this artwork that is important, that is an important treasure to the history of Papua New Guinea and Australia. I think I'll stop here, but uh, thank you indeed for your honor. Uh, so there are some very important themes there of a white woman's eyes, seeing different tensions, and I would encourage you to go online and to look at the images that are digitised. Over half of them have never been made accessible to researchers before and one of the most interesting sections for me is the nurses sections where she asked the Indigenous nurses to write 
their, about their life, to write about their ambitions, and it is very interesting to see the tensions about what will democracy mean for Papua New Guinea, what will identity mean for Papua New Guinea, what will nationhood mean for Papua New Guinea, and some of those issues may not be fully resolved yet. So there's a rich wealth of resources for us to see. But before we have refreshments, I wanted to make some thank yous. Um, I thank you again to the Pacific Institute for their support. Thank you to all the wonderful researchers at ANU who have provided a wealth of knowledge that we build on with this exhibition. Thank you to Mariana Pickler, who was the branch manager at um, the Menzies Library, to Margaret Prescott and Pamela, who have been the powerhouse behind the exhibition, to Kay Dancy for the Carto GIS work, the Drill Hall Gallery staff for the loan of works and assistance, to all of the those who have very kindly lent the Papua New Guinean materials, to Sarah Lesbridge and other archive staff, to Deveni Timu, to Heather Jenks, to ITS. Thank you. Genevieve, Peter, Zul, we could not do any of this without the great support from ITS. Um, thank you to Elgie Dawson, who runs our repository, to Mark Huppert, who assisted in so many ways, Patrick Burns, Nick Wilburn, and thank you so much to our speakers and the Papua New Guinean High Commissioner. And it is now time for drinks and celebration. Mm -hmm.